Okay, I'm seeing vaping products in front of me like something I've never seen before. So I'm very excited about this grand round. So uh, it's 8.01, it's always uh, my time that I start. And as usual, I'm going to say uh, thank all of you for coming to Grand Rounds and taking an hour of time to just take care of yourself and learn something new and uh, increase your knowledge about medicine. So Harvest Moon was out this week. It's been beautiful. Big, giant orange moons have been rising out of the sky, so take advantage of watching that this weekend. And with that, I'm going to talk to you about Grand Rounds. So today, we have Dr. Brian Williams, who is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Hospital Medicine, both in pediatrics and adult medicine, both in the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics from University of Wisconsin, presenting our Grand Rounds, e-cigarettes and vaping, a failed social experiment. And I think it's an incredible group of people who's already here today. Uh, and I think that's just such a, a timely and important topic. And he does have time for questions afterwards. So just a little bit about Dr. Williams. You know, I always like to tell you a little bit about the history of the person who's doing grand rounds. He did his medical degree here at University of Wisconsin, and then went to do his internship and his residency at University of California in San Diego. And that was followed by a fellowship in pediatric medicine. And his internship and residency was in MedPed, so it was in a combination for that. He then went on and practiced at University of California, San Diego for several years as an assistant clinical professor in internal medicine and pediatrics. And we were very lucky to have him join us in 2018. He has had an interest in tobacco cessation for many years, and he has been on the American Academy of Pediatrics section of tobacco control. And just in 2019, he received the American Academy of Pediatrics Julius B. Richmond Center of Excellence New Investigator Grant to study smoke exposure screening. He has had some incredible awards very uh, early in his career. In 2017, he received the UCSD Pediatric Residency Program Attending of the Year Award. That's fantastic. And I don't know how he did this, but in 2016 and 2017, in the first couple years of his career, he was in San Diego Magazine's Top Doc Awards Group. And I think the last thing I'm going to mention before I invite him up onto stage is he was inducted in 2008 into the Gold Humanism Honor Society, really with attributes that are incredibly important to us here at University of Wisconsin. And then one last thing I do want to mention, he's been invited to participate with the CTRI, the Center for Tobacco Research and Innovation Group, to start to work with them in the area of smoking cessation, which I think is also a fantastic honor. With this, Dr. Williams, please come up. And I tried not to touch your vaping <laughs> paraphernalia. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Kilbridge. You know, I'm really excited to be here. Um, six, eight weeks ago when I started preparing for this talk, I had no idea the information that was going to be coming down the pipeline. We now know that over a quarter of high school students are using vaping products. And we now have an outbreak of a lung disease caused by vaping that has led to over 1,400 illnesses and 33 deaths. So this topic is incredibly timely. It's a very hot topic, and I'm really excited to, to have this discussion with you all today. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And I'll start by sort of going over our goals for today's talk. One, I'm hoping you can leave with traditional cigarettes on the forefront of your mind. We know traditional cigarettes continue to be a huge problem for society, and traditional cigarettes are what have led to the creation of the e-cigarette a hopefully safer way to get that nicotine in smokers. We're going to go over e-cigarettes, give you a chance to hold these devices, smell some of the liquids, see how the devices work. And then we'll follow that by going over some of the data on what we have as far as using these e-cigarettes to help the adult smoker quit. Oops, sorry. We'll uh, go over the epidemic of adolescent vaping. This is a huge, um, there's been a huge rise over the past um, several years, and this is largely why I call this a failed social experiment. And then we'll close with the new outbreak, which the CDC has now coined e volley or e-cigarette and vaping-associated um, lung injury. So again, I always like to start these talks by saying that cigarettes are bad, and everyone knows cigarettes are bad. 
There's been tons of research over the past several decades that have linked cigarettes to numerous adverse health consequences. The public knows cigarettes are bad. You ask, ask the average person on the street about cigarettes, everyone knows they cause lung, lung cancer. So we've done a great job disseminating the research and the data that we have to the public so that people know the harms of cigarettes. We also know there's a lot of other things that cigarettes can cause. Cigarettes affect essentially every organ in the body. Cigarettes continue to be the number one preventable cause of death here in the United States as well as worldwide. So we still have a major cigarette issue. So bad that 1,300 people are gonna die today from smoking cigarettes. About 20 of them will be in the state of Wisconsin. It's not all doom and gloom. There's been incredible progress since the first Surgeon General report came out in 1964. At that point, 46% of adults were smoking cigarettes. That's had a nice steady decline to 14% currently nationally. We're at around 16% in the state of Wisconsin. So there's been huge progress. And a lot of this is that we have denormalized cigarettes. Cigarettes are no longer cool. They're no, no longer ubiquitous. We don't have to smell them when we go out to eat. People don't use cigarettes like they were using them because they're not cool anymore. They're not popular, and everyone knows they're not safe. Legislation has already also played a, a big role in our declining cigarette rates. Here in the state of Wisconsin, the Clean Air Act, the, the act that banned smoking in all bars and restaurants, workplaces, was passed in 2009. And in 2009, there was also really important federal legislation that helped protect children from cigarettes. They banned all flavored cigarettes. They also did a lot of things that limited how cigarette companies could market these devices. They limited sales and, and vending machines, limited the small packs of cigarettes, a lot of things that were popular amongst kids. So we've seen incredible success. On top of that, a smaller percentage of people are smoking, but those that are smoking are smoking fewer cigarettes. So again, a lot of good news out there. 14% of our population still smoking. Well, that's about 34 million people. So we still have a lot of work to be done. We also know this is an incredibly expensive consequence. We're paying over $300 billion a year in direct medical costs as well as lost productivity. And we know that certain groups are affected by cigarette smoke a lot more. There's certain rates that are a lot higher. People that are of lower education, this people with a GED, 36%. If you have a four-year high school degree, that drops the smoking rate down to the upper teens. College, you're well into the single digits. We also know income plays a big role. And this is a disease, an addiction, that really affects those in the lower income bracket. So in, in a way, this is a social justice issue as well. So bring on the revolution, right? Here's the e-cigarette. This is Han Leek. He is largely credited with inventing the modern day e-cigarette. He's a Chinese pharmacist. His dad died as a complication from smoking cigarettes and he was addicted and could not quit. So he is part of this revolution. But I would say this idea, this concept of getting smokers off the combustible cigarette onto a safer alternative has been around for a long, long time. I found this patent was approved in 1965 for the smokeless non-tobacco cigarette. So this is an idea that people have had for a long time, but it's really only come to fruition in the last 10 years. So let's go over how e-cigarettes work. So all e-cigarettes have a battery, and the job of that battery is to heat up a metal coil. And the metal coil gets very warm, and there's some nuances here. Other devices can use other things. There's some ceramic coils, things like that. But for the sake of this argument, the battery heats up a metal coil, and that metal coil comes in contact with a liquid. And that liquid is what houses the nicotine and the flavors. And that liquid turns into an aerosol. And that aerosol, or what people often call uh, a vapor, then gets inhaled by the user. And I would say that vapor is actually a misnomer. So a vapor is the gaseous form of a liquid. An aerosol is a gas with liquid particles or solid particles suspended in it. And that's exactly what people are inhaling. They're inhaling an aerosol. There are so solid particles suspended in that gas. So let's look at a little bit of the e-cigarette evolution. I've got some devices here that I want to pass around. 
So the first generation is the Sig Alike, and I've got one here, and the goal here was really to recreate the traditional cigarette. So this is largely the battery. This section holds the e-juice, or the liquid nicotine. You screw it together, and you're off and smoking. The second generation is the vape pen. So you can see this is a little bit bigger device. It's got a stronger battery. So this can aerosolize a larger volume of liquid with each puff, each hit that you take. This also has a larger cartridge here where you can see where you can hold your e-juice. One of the challenges with e-cigarettes is that there's no shutoff device. You know, you're driving in the car, you're smoking your cigarette, you know, 15, 20 puffs later, the cigarette burns out, it's over, the process is done. Sure, you can pick up another cigarette, but there is a whole new process that starts over. You get an e-cigarette with a large enough container of solution, you can be driving in that car puffing and puffing and puffing, you're on a three hour car ride, you may hit 40, 45 milligrams of nicotine. You know, it depends on how frequently you hit this, but there isn't a shutoff device, so I worry that people are smoking these much differently than they are cigarettes. Third generation is the mod, and the mod is basically the vape pen on steroids. So they've increased the size of the battery, they've increased the cartridge size that contains the liquid, and really what that stronger battery can do is aerosolize a much larger amount of the liquid. These aren't nearly as popular as they were two, three years ago, but I'm sure everyone can remember seeing that person walking down the street, they take their hit, and you see this just mushroom cloud of <laughs> smoke around them, and that's a mod, so mods are extremely powerful. And we'll pass those around in a sec. But next I wanna talk about the e-juice, and I've got a couple of bottles here that I'll, I'll pass around as well. If you look at the ingredient list on the back of these bottles, Four ingredients. Nicotine, so there's a free base nicotine in here, and that's dissolved in propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin are very common in our food supply. We see them, they're used as additives in food. They're in cosmetic products, cream, so these are deemed to be pretty safe. And then there's this catch-all term of flavorings. So one of the concerns, one of the concerns with flavoring is diacetyl. Diacetyl, especially in a lot of the early e-juices, was exceedingly common. What diacetyl is known for is popcorn lung. In the early 2000s, people that were working in popcorn factories were coming down with cases of bronchiolitis obliterans. And it ultimately got traced back to the diacetyl that was in the popcorn flavoring. So diacetyl is not a, a safe product. And again, people don't have to disclose what's in those flavorings. They just write flavorings on the back. So I'll pass these around, and I encourage you to take the cap off and try and smell it. These are all child-proofed because in the, early, or in the early 2010s, there were several deaths from kids drinking these. They would overdose on nicotine, and would, several kids die, and the federal government in 2016 passed some packaging regulations. I'll also highlight sort of the flavor. This one's lemonade, and I encourage you to smell this. This one's called Naked Unicorn. <laughs> you hear Naked Unicorn, for me at least, three automatic questions. One, aren't all unicorns naked? <laughs> right? Two, who gets to decide what a naked unicorn smells like? And three, who are we appealing to? Right? We're not appealing to the 50-year-old smoker that's been smoking for 30 years. And e-juice companies don't pretend to be appealing to adults. They'll appeal to anyone. The device makers on their hand will talk to, they're appealing to adults. But e-cigarette, ju er, excuse me, e-juice makers, they just want to sell the product. So I'll pass this around. So I and, just start and you can just yeah. Great. And this is also an important time for me to just thank the Department of Medicine for their generous academic enrichment fund, which has allowed me to stockpile all these devices. <laughs> So next, as the e-cigarette has evolved, so has the juice. So now we have something called Nick Salts. And Nick Salts have helped revolutionize the e-cigarette industry. What Nick Salts are, they're e-juice, but what they did is they added benzoic acid to the solution. And what that does is it lowers the pH of the aerosol, allows it to have a smoother sort of throat hit, so you can vape more aggressively 
without having the irritation to the back of your throat that some of the traditional e-cigarettes have. The other thing it does, it is allows an aerosol to be created at a, low, at a lower temperature. So that has allowed the batteries to shrink and brought us to the modern day e-cigarette, which is the pod mod. This one is specifically a jewel. And you can see this design, it's brilliant. You can't distinguish this from 10 feet away from a USB stick. So the jewel is the absolute king of the e-cigarette market. And as they've become more popular, there's been a lot of knockoff um, brands that have developed. There's a lot of people have tried to recreate the Juul. Um, but this is, it's very slick. You got this stick, it comes with a pre-filled little pod here that has the nicotine e-juice. You pop it in and you're off um, and you're vaping. Another one I wanna show you is the Swarin Drop. Again, hopefully you can see this. Very thin, very small. And again, the concern with this that I have is this doesn't come with pre-filled nicotine. This comes with a couple wells here. You can, as I pass this around, you just open these up. You can stick anything in here. So you can stick whatever flavor of e-cigarette juice in here that you wanna use. You wanna throw a little THC juice in there? Go ahead, CBD oil. You wanna mix them, combine them. There's a lot you can do. You can get really creative with these devices that allow you to fill them yourself. So I'll pass these around. And this also is a bottle of Nick Salt. And you can look this, look, this looks like taffy. This is a candy flavored, strawberry flavored Nick Salt e juice. So I'll pass those around too. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the e cigarette. So um, the Juul specifically was a concept that came out of the Stanford Grad School uh, in 2004, originally called the Vroom. They had a lot of rounds of funding, they had a product that sort of evolved. And in 2000, 15, the Juul was launched. So this is a relatively new device. They got so big, Altria, which is the US form of Philip Morris, they wanted in. This was big, big money. They gave them a 35% stake for $12.8 billion. That's a valuation of $38 billion for a product that's only been around for three years. So this has absolutely shot up the market. And you can see here, they've pushed a lot of the other devices, much lower. So, so Juul is absolutely dominating um, the e-cigarette market. So we've got these devices. We're told it's a safer alternative to smoking. It's, it's, it's harm reduction. So let's go over the aerosol a little bit. So one thing I want to take, for you to take away is that this aerosol is not harmless. There's lots of studies that have been done on what's actually in that aerosol, and we know there's carcinogens. We know there's, there's metals that are being inhaled directly into the lung. We also know there's these things called VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds. The Rubenstein article that I cite at the bottom, that actually looked at VOCs in healthy controls, in adolescent healthy controls, adolescents that were using e-cigarettes and adolescents that were using combustible cigarettes. The VOCs in the healthy control, very low. Significantly higher in the e-cigarette group, but dramatically higher in the combustible cigarette group. And I think that's a takeaway. These devices aren't safe, but the level of chemicals in them is certainly lower than the traditional cigarette. A challenge here is we don't have long-term data. We don't know what the lung's gonna do with 20, 30 years of vaping. But you compare it to a traditional cigarette where we've got over 7,000 chemicals identified, 50 carcinogens, concentrations much, much higher than the e-cigarette. Yeah, this seems like a better alternative to the cigarette. It, it, I shouldn't say it seems. The National Academies of Science said there's conclusive evidence that if you completely substitute e-cigarettes for traditional cigarettes, you reduce the user's exposure to numerous toxicants and carcinogens that are present in the cigarette. So there's a lot of data supporting that these are truly a safer alternative from a toxin standpoint than the traditional cigarette. Public Health England has been, been very aggressive in pushing e-cigarettes on their um, smokers. They're using this term consistently that, that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than the traditional cigarette. So let's look at e-cigarettes for sensation, because this is why these devices came to market. The goal is to get people off of the traditional cigarette onto a, a device that's, that's safer. So actually there's a Cochrane review that was done in 2014 
was only able to include two randomized control trials, but did find in these two trials that comparing the electronic cigarette to the placebo or a zero nicotine e-cigarette, the electronic cigarette, you know, it showed some promise. Overall, they graded it as low um, quality, um, their statement, but you know, there's, there's certainly some signals out there, especially in the early 2010s, that these devices can help. One of the challenges with these early studies is that the devices have evolved so much. The studies that they were using, the, the, the sort of first generation e-cigarettes, aren't anything like they are, are now. So some of this data is hard to sort of interpret in today's setting. The review literature got a little confusing in 2016 when a group out of UCSF, Calcarin and Stan Glantz, said that those that had used e-cigarettes actually had lower rates of quitting than those that, that hadn't. So they, they said there was a 28%, their odds of quitting were 28% lower, which sort of surprised, and that's not what most of the signals have said, but this created some con confusion. A group out of Toronto came to a very somewhat different conclusion with their systematic um, review saying the, the data was inconclusive, but that overall the existing literature suggests e-cigarettes can be helpful to help people quit smoking. So we're going to look at a couple um, studies that have come out over the past few years, because I do think there's a signal here clearly that e-cigarettes can help people get off combustible cigarettes. So we're going to go over some of this, this data. So this was done out of New Zealand. This was, um, they recruited people that were interested, motivated in quitting smoking. And they basically assigned them in a one to four to four ratio of either nicotine replacement therapy patches only, that was a 21 milligram patch, they got a 14 week supply. Or they got that same patch plus an electronic cigarette, it was a vape pen, 18 milligram, so a decent strength e-liquid that went with it. Versus a group that got patches, but a placebo, so a zero milligram e-cigarette. And I bring up the loss to follow-up because all these studies have high rates of loss to follow-up. It's usually 20, 30, 40 percent. And I think tobacco cessation studies are tough because you feel guilty, you feel shame, you haven't quit smoking. So it's always common, but that it's always common that you don't have, that you have a significant group that is lost to follow-up. But all these use the intention to treat. And you can see here, people that got the e-cigarette with the patches, they did a little bit better than um, the nicotine only group. You know, the confidence interval crosses one, but there's certainly a signal there. They also did better than the group that got the placebo e-cigarette. So again, getting that short acting um, nicotine seems to help. One comment that's interesting about the placebo e-cigarette is you're still providing the user with that oral fixation that they're used to, that habitual hand movement, hand, hand to mouth movement. So it's not a true placebo like we think of in medicine studies but it's there nonetheless. Another study I want to look at is um, a cohort study. So this was done in France in 2014. And at that time, the French um, health department was planning a very aggressive media campaign to get people off of cigarettes. And they did a big survey of the population before this media campaign started as one way to judge sort of where, where they were at from a public health standpoint. But they were also able to break down um, their data and look at dual users. So a dual user is somebody that uses both an electronic cigarette and the traditional cigarette. So they're using both devices. <laughs> and they compared that to a group that was using just traditional cigarettes. And the question was, gosh, let's look at these people after six months and see where they're at. They had three main outcomes. One was to see who could reduce their cigarette use over that six month period by 50%. Who could have a seven day, a successful seven day quit attempt in the last month of the six month period? And who was actually able to have quit for seven days when they got followed up? And you can see those first two outcomes, the group that was a dual user, those that were using the e-cigarette, seemed to be successful. They used the e-cigarette successfully to cut down on their cigarette intake by over 50%. And they also had higher number of quit attempts that were able to last for seven days. But you can see the actual cessation wasn't significantly different when they looked at seven days or a secondary analysis that looked at 30 days. So again, these dual users were able to sort of substitute the e-cigarette for the conventional cigarette. And you know, one thing I do, do want to note, out, note is that the dual users 
they were more motivated when they were surveyed. They were, they were a group that was more inclined to quit smoking in the next six months. So they were a more motivated group. So that may be playing a role, but it seems like the fact that they're using these devices to cut down on cigarettes, it does work. It doesn't necessarily help them quit. One interesting thing that the paper notes is that um, of those that were actually able to truly quit cigarettes, those that were older were the ones that found the e-cigarette helpful in helping them quit. And I think that's a part of looking at the bigger argument of e-cigarettes. There is definitively a group of people that are gonna benefit from the e-cigarette and maybe it's that older adult who's tried quitting nine or 10 times, who's been through all seven FDA approved quitting medications, but they still can't quit. Maybe that's the population that e-cigarettes are gonna work best in. The last study I wanna look at is sort of, I think the best randomized um, trial we have. This came out in, I think, February in the New England Journal. And this came out of um, England where the NHS has stopped uh, smoking clinics, just like you can see advertised outside here at the VA, where there's people that are motivated to quit and they come to these clinics looking to, to help them quit. And what uh, these authors did was they enrolled people into one or two groups. You had to not have any sort of an, uh, a preference as far as which group you're going to go into, whether you're going to go into the e-cigarette group or the nicotine replacement therapy group. And then they randomized um, people to NRT of their choice, which consisted of really whatever you wanted. The vast majority used these as we would encourage with using both a patch for the long acting nicotine and then the gum to hit those cravings. So the, I think it was in the 80% of people got both two forms of NRT. The other group got an e-cigarette starter pack. So they got one 30 milliliter bottle of e-juice and an e-cigarette and they were encouraged to buy more e-juice and the flavors of their choice after that e-cigarette ran out. They all got four weeks of counseling as well. And their primary outcome was to do carbon monoxide um, proven cessation at a year. So carbon monoxide is a good marker that's oftentimes used for tobacco or excuse me, combustible cigarette use. If you've smoked a cigarette in roughly the last 24 plus hours, carbon monoxide will be exhaled. And you can see the e-cigarette group did better almost twice as good as the nicotine replacement therapy. So we were able to get 18% of participants off traditional cigarettes. So that's great. There's a kicker, 80% of these people were still using an e-cigarette. Full disclosure, the nicotine replacement therapy, about 20% of those people that quit were actually using an e-cigarette. So this, you know, it shows that there's some promise. It can help people get off um, traditional cigarettes. I look at this though and say, this e-cigarette group, 16 people are breathing fresh air. The nicotine replacement therapy group, 35 people are breathing fresh air every day. Nothing toxic's going into the lungs. That's about 8% of that group and only 4% of this group. Dr. St our own James Stein had a commentary in this um, edition of the journal. He reviewed this and went over some of the um, supplementary index data and, and found that, yes, he broke it down very nicely as far as percentages. He said, for every 100 people that are assigned to that e-cigarette group, sure, 18 quit or 18% quit, but 14 are still using e-cigarettes. But he also noted that an additional 25 people became dual users. So for every 18 people that quit, 25 became dual users. And we don't know the long-term consequence of dual use. Maybe those 25 are gonna keep cutting back their traditional cigarette use, we don't know. So there's still a lot of questions out there, but again, there's certainly some signals that e-cigarettes help. And I'll quote the great Dr. Fiore here on campus. We don't have compelling evidence yet that e-cigarettes help adults to quit. There's some suggestive evidence but not conclusive evidence. And that's where I think we're at, and I think we're gonna get a lot more information um, in the years to come. So again, I'll, I'll conclude this section by saying, e-cigarettes are less toxic than traditional cigarettes. I think we can be confident in that statement. And gosh, they likely have a role in helping people quit cigarettes. There's a but. There's a big but. <laughs> e-cigarettes have taken off 
in the adolescent population. You talk to any school administrator and they're <coughs> exhausted with e-cigarettes. They're very difficult to control. As you pass these devices around, you can see you could hide these in your shirt pocket. You know, kids are playing a game where they'll see if they can get the teacher to allow them to charge the jewel in their personal laptop. Because the teachers just think it's a USB stick. I don't know if USB sticks that need to be charged, but aside from that, I mean, teenagers are brilliant. And you can see this is a problem. So let's go over some data about how we're doing in smoking. If you look at traditional cigarette use in high school students, we've had a great decline. In 2017, only 8% of high schoolers admitted to smoking cigarettes in the past 30 days. If you look at e-cigarettes, there's been a steady rise, and since 2014, e-cigarettes have been the number one tobacco product used by adolescents. I do want to highlight 2014, 2015, there's a jump. They changed the way the question was asked, so I think that's a little bit of a, the way the question was asked than a true, we had a big spike and we came down. But that's sort of where we're at. Now fast forward to 2018, e-cigarette use skyrocketed, 78% in one year. This came out as a preliminary report last September. FDA Commissioner Doug Gottlieb called adolescent vaping an epidemic, increased oversight on a lot of the e-cigarette makers, increased raids of retail stores that were selling to minors. So they were, this generated a lot of activity by the FDA. And then we'll look at 2019. We're up to 27.5% of high schoolers admit to using e-cigarettes. Like, this is shocking. And I worry we're setting up a whole generation for nicotine addiction. And by the way, this is self-report. So the fact if we actually tested kids, I'm worried it'd be a lot higher. So why do we care? So nicotine addiction is a pediatric disease. We think of this as in adults. You know, pediatricians don't commonly think of, you know, hitting the, the teenager, teenage smoker as a major priority. But it's a pediatric disease. And I'll read a quote here. Today's teenager is tomorrow's potential regular customer, and the overwhelming majority of smokers first begin to smoke while still in their teens. The smoking patterns of teenagers are particularly important to Philip Morris. This has been known for decades. Everyone knows if you want a lifelong customer, you have to hit them when they're teenagers. Anyone here who is a teenager at home, who has raised a teenager, knows that their brain is just different. <laughs> so our prefrontal cortex, which is really what helps separate us from primates, that's what gives us our higher thought processes, our cognitive abilities, it's very much developing through the mid-20s. <coughs> Decision making, impulse control, executive function, these are all important um, jobs of the prefrontal cortex. And there's nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that are very active in the prefrontal cortex, helping develop a lot of these neural circuits, a lot of connections between the amygdala, which is a sort of our emotional center of our brain. Nicotine gets in there and sort of gums up the whole process. It binds where the nor normal neurotransmitter acetylcholine should be binding. And we know we can see structural changes in these brains that are exposed to nicotine. We also know that as the sort of reward circuits get set up and hardwired, we know the brain, the adolescent brain that is exposed to nicotine has an increased risk of future substance abuse. So there's something very active going on in that brain and nicotine I think is just sort of destroying the pathways. We also know that if you surveyed all adult smokers, more than 90% of them started smoking before the age of 18. 95% of them by 21, and 99.9 .9 by 26. So if you make it to 26 without ever smoking a cigarette, the likelihood that you're gonna become adult, an adult smoker is essentially zero. The former Surgeon General sort of summed it up well, and I'll read this again. Compared with older adults, the brain of youth and young adults is more vulnerable to the negative consequences of nicotine exposure, including addiction, priming for use of other addictive substances, reduced impulse control, deficits in attention and cognition, and mood disorders. So nicotine is devastating 
on the adolescent brain. Nicotine alone, I'm not even talking about the carcinogens that are inhaled. So a couple of major sort of conclusions, key conclusions that came. Again, nicotine, very bad. We know e-cigarettes, they emit toxins, <laughs> certainly less than the traditional cigarette. But obviously there's some plausibility here if you're exposing the lung to carcinogens, there's a big risk that over time we're gonna ha see cancer develop. We can't say that, these devices haven't been around long enough, but that's sort of where we're at. Other challenge is, of these kids, who is going to start with these cigarettes and then it's gonna be a gateway to combustion and traditional cigarettes? I think that's another worry. So there's been a lot of studies that have sort of sampled adolescents, sort of seen where they were at 12 months later. So um, there's a systematic review that sort of reviewed these articles. There was nine articles, I think seven of them had 12 month follow up, one had a six month follow up and the other had a 16 month follow up. But on average we'll say they were resurveyed at 12 months. And you can see if at that starting point, if you had not used an e-cigarette in the past 30 days, a year later, only 4.6% of that population was using a traditional cigarette. If at the starting point, you had used an e-cigarette in the past 30 days, fast forward a year, the chance that you've used a combustible cigarette is 21.5%. So they've got some pooled odds ratios here. So we know that people that are using cigarettes have a higher odds ratio of using a combustible cigarette. And they tried to control for some of the psychosocial factors that affect cigarette initiation. So it seems like it's not just the, the kid that wants to rebel, but the e-cigarette is, as in itself, is playing a role. National Academies of Science also commented on this, sort of a weaker statement, but they say there's substantial evidence that e-cigarette use increases the risk of ever using combustible cigarettes. So I still think there's plenty to be learned here, but again, it's one of those things. There's some signals that people that use e-cigarettes are transitioning to combustible cigarettes. So how did we get here? So I'll start by saying that I think there's three big things. You know, there's no doubt these devices have been marketed to youth. You know, there's also the safety concern. These have been advertised as harm reduction, the safe alternative to smoking, and we'll see how teenagers interpret that. And then there's the appeal of flavors, and we're gonna spend some time talking about that as well. And as you smell those devices, you can see they smell sweet, they smell good. There's a reason you'd wanna use this. It's not like the first time you smoke that cigarette when you have to sort of choke it down. No, your first hit with an e-cigarette can be rather enjoyable. So marketing, so um, Jenny McCarthy, she is bringing sexy back. Um, you can see she was the first spokesperson for the blue cigarette. And again, we're trying to sort of renormalize e-cigarettes. Juul had a very aggressive social media campaign. This is from their YouTube page where they're you know, hiring young models to use these devices and sort of look hip and cool. This on the left is from Jewel's Instagram account and you see you can't show teenagers this picture. Teenagers see that and say, I wanna be there. I wanna be that person. And you look at this guy on the left, 37 year old Brian looks at him and says, God, it looks sort of stupid, this thing <laughs> sticking out of his mouth. 17-year-old Brian says, that guy's a lot crueler than I am. <laughs> if you were there, you'd agree. <laughs> so again, we'll switch a little bit to the safety component of this. So these are marketed sort of appropriately to smokers as harm reduction. They're the safe alternative to smoking. But if you're a teenager, you're not doing a risk-benefit analysis of this. You're thinking, gosh, I heard safe. I heard harmless. These devices are good. You know, there's also this misconception of vapor. When we think vapor, we think water. You know, this is not a vapor. This is an aerosol with fine particles with toxicants in it. And then there's the misleading component of flavors, right? So, you know, I put these up in their beautiful colors. I want my kids to eat this stuff, right? I don't want it to go in their lungs. But you, you see mango, banana, fruit medley, that's good stuff. Jules got their vanilla pot up there with a nice healthy salad. This is, the, <laughs> this is the exact same technique that traditional cigarettes were doing. In the 50s and 60s, you can find cigarette ads next to healthy food. So what do teens actually say in their e-cigarettes? You know, the vast, vast majority say it's just 
flavoring. Okay, only 13% admit that there's nicotine in there. And I think the group that's probably the most accurate is this group that's saying, shoot, we don't know, 13%, because I think that's probably the reality with how different some of these e-juices can be as well. So flavors, so there have been a lot of flavors on the market. This is a study out of, I think it was 2014, identified over 8,000 flavors. And you can see the way they market this. This is being marketed towards kids and kids love them, we know that. 2015, 85% of kids came out and said, gosh, they use cigarettes because they come in flavors I like. The Wisconsin Youth Tobacco Survey, which is done every two years, last year came out and they said that 89% of Wisconsin high schoolers reported they wouldn't use e-cigarettes if they weren't flavored. So this has a huge appeal amongst youth. I mean, look at this picture, I mean, that's, Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> Chocolate milk. <laughs> so again, so I look at this argument and I say, you know, we've got this device that is certainly safer than the traditional cigarette. And there's people out there that are really struggling with cigarette addiction. You know, we've got seven FDA approved medications on the market. A lot of people have been through these medicines and not had success. Do those people deserve an option? Can we really help those people? I do think we can. I just worry the collateral damage that we're causing in pediatrics and the absolute rise in popularity with these devices, setting up kids for lifelong nicotine addiction and potential plausible cancer in the future, I just don't think it's worth it. Now, is there a way to do this? Gosh, there should be. Banning all flavors might make a huge impact. Putting strict regulations on these devices in the e-juices can make a huge impact. In a way, we need to make cigarettes boring. Nicotine replacement therapy is boring. We need to make e-cigarettes boring so that they appeal to the smoker that truly wants to quit and not the kid. So normally, I'd sort of end my talk here and subject myself to 15 minutes of questions. But we still have to talk about the, so I, this is my graphic. So again, I think the adolescent use outweighs it, but um, we still have to talk about the latest with, with vaping. And that's what's now been coined by the CDC, e-volley, or e-cigarette, or vaping product use associated lung injury. And this came, this has been sort of rapidly developing over the past several months, this came as a result of Children's Hospital of Wisconsin on July 10th reported five cases of severe lung injury in, in adolescents who had vaped in the past month. All of them had negative infectious workup, and they were concerned that the vaping devices were leading to this lung injury. End of July, Illinois had a case, and on August 1st, the public health departments of Wisconsin and Illinois started a joint investigation. And the preliminary report was actually published pretty quickly, September 9th in the New England Journal. They defined a probable case as somebody who's come in having used an e-cigarette or dabbing, and dabbing is heating up a marijuana wax, a high concentrate under a flame and directly inhaling it. Um, so you had to have used an e-cigarette or dab in the past 90 days. You have to have pulmonary infiltrates on your imaging. You have to have no alternative explanation for the workup, whether it's infectious or a, another organ system. They included the probable case definition as, yeah, maybe you had a positive um, infection finding, but the team didn't feel that that explained the lung finding. So we see those respiratory PCRs that come back with a rhinovirus or something. Um, so they came up with 53 cases in their preliminary report. You can see they're pretty young. A third of these <laughs> cases were under 18 years of age. The vast majority, or all patients showed up essentially with constitutional symptoms weight loss, extreme fatigue, um, respiratory symptoms, but a lot were also having abdominal symptoms. And abdominal symptoms oftentimes can precede the, the respiratory symptoms. Now interestingly, they found that the vast, vast majority of these um, people use THC, 84%. There's a component that only use THC over a third, and THC is the active ingredient in marijuana, so that's what a lot of people are, are vaping that wanna get high. Um, and a small percentage used nicotine only. 
A lot of this is self-report, so disclosing THC use in a state where THC is illegal might be difficult, so I'm not sure if, you know, this is the number we have. On the radiographs, they had 100, every single radiograph had bilateral infiltrates. And actually, in last week's New England Journal, there's a short series that was published, Jeffrey Kahn from UW was on it, where they published four different CT findings. So if you're interested in the imaging findings, I, I encourage you to look at the latest New England Journal. How did they treat these people? 92% got steroids, 90% got antibiotics, probably out of an overabundance of caution. Um, there's a lot of ICU stays, a lot of <laughs> intubations, and there's one death. So this got, this um, investigation got updated on October 4th. This was their final report, came out in MMWR, where there's a total of 127 cases. And again, the key takeaway here is that the vast majority used THC. And this isn't the commercial grade THC that's being made in California, <coughs> Oregon, Colorado. This seems to be THC that's coming off the street. Whether that's imported from those states or homegrown, it seems to be there's a lot of actually homegrown um, um, THC. There was certainly a percentage that probably dual used, used nicotine as well, and only a small percentage that reported using nicotine only. So again, I, there's a strong concern that this is a THC issue, and that's why I separate it from the argument of e-cigarettes, because I do think this is a separate issue, but there, we're still trying to learn, out, learn some more information about that. The CDC is really struggling with this, because as you can see, there were 234 unique products used. So trying to isolate what exactly is causing this, I think is extremely difficult. And one thing that they did report is that this term dank vapes, people were smoking pods that were um, labeled as dank vapes, two thirds of them. And I'll tell you, I went to madeinchina.com and I can buy dank vapes cartridges. I also went to Reddit, which I encourage no one to go to, <laughs> and I found out how you can make marijuana with one search. It's pretty quick to make liquid marijuana. And what people are doing is they're trying to make their homegrown marijuana look like commercial grade. So whether it's the coloring, the thickness, they're adding different things to their homegrown marijuana e-liquid to try and make it commercial. And that's where I worry, and that's where I think a lot of people worry this illness is coming from. Some product is being added to the marijuana. And again, we've all seen the headlines. There's a lot of these operations running in our state. A lot of people have you know, gotten arrested, and there's a lot of money to be made here. People are making millions and millions of dollars. So this data came out yesterday. Um, we're up to 1,400 cases. You can see this is a disease that's affecting the younger generations. And we're up to 33 deaths in 24 states. So this is still very problematic. Again, I think this is a separate issue from the bigger e-cigarette conversation. But this is driving a lot of media interest around regulating e-cigarettes. The current CDC guidelines are that no one should vape any THC products. There are reports, there were some deaths in Oregon of people that claim to have only bought commercial grade THC. Don't buy any products off the street. Don't modify any products that are, are used as well. This is the challenge though. The smokers who quit and are using an e-cigarette, they're in a tough position. They're wondering what to do. A few weeks ago, the CDC was saying, consider refraining from e-cigarette use, but absolutely do not go back to combustible cigarettes. That's been consistent. Last week they were saying, consider using FDA um, approved treatments. And now they're saying, weigh the risks and benefits of e-cigarette use, and consider using the FDA approved nicotine replacement therapies. You know, if you don't use an e-cigarette, don't start. And youth, young adults, and women, these absolutely, these people should not be using any vaping device. So I'll sort of close with a summary. E-cigarettes, yes, they have fewer toxins in them than combustible cigarettes. They likely have a, a role in helping that smoker quit and get off the very toxic traditional cigarettes. But again, 
the way e-cigarettes are now, they are appealing to youth in much too high of a, a, a rate, and we're at risk of having a whole new generation of kids and future adults addicted to nicotine and potentially cigarettes. And we don't know the long-term data on e-cigarettes. It's plausible that you know, they can cause cancer, but it's also very plausible that they're not gonna cause cancer like cigarettes do. And this current e volley outbreak, which we're now calling it, seems to be largely related to counterfeit THC, but the exact etiology is unknown. So I'll close it there and open it up for any questions. Fantastic, and Thank updating you. your slides the day before with new data is unbelievable. And uh, so let's open up to questions. Yes. Yeah. I, I assume they can use these amazing products for other inhalants such as uh, uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, morphine, fentanyl. Uh, has there been any evidence that this has been happening? So not that I am aware of, but yes, you can modify these devices any way you want. Okay, sorry. So yeah, not that I'm aware of. I don't think people are using opiates or anything to vape. I haven't heard that. Rapid response team, main hospital, first floor, Delta wing, lobby. Yeah. You know what Rapid response team, differences between main hospital, first floor, versus like Delta wing, cigarette user, lobby. Is your data like what costs more? What is impacting the lowering? Yeah. So the question is on the cost of e-cigarettes versus the traditional cigarette. Um, it, it all depends, obviously, on how much you use. How much you use likely depends on the nicotine concentration <laughs> that you're using. So I think it's hard to say. Cigarettes are, have become more and more expensive. So I think we're up to $7 in um, Wisconsin. Um, whereas a vape pen is a relatively cheap investment, maybe $20. Juul, as you can see, is now down to you know, $10 for, I think, for a starter stick. And then the pods used to be $4 a pod, and that was considered to be equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. So if we're doing the pod of e-juice to a pack of cigarettes, a pod's cheaper. Pods aren't really taxed here in Wisconsin. It's five cents per milliliter. That was the latest um, budget that got passed. Um, so I think e-cigarettes are probably cheaper if you're doing an equivalent pack per day. Yeah. Is there any data about secondhand e-cigarette smoke use, like especially with like parents of infants? Uh, you know, there's a big push that traditional cigarettes with kids on your clothes and things like that. Right. So especially in pediatrics. Question. Repeat. Oh, sorry. The, so the question was about secondhand e-cigarette. <laughs> Um, inhaling and there is we know that in a confined space we know that the secondhand exposure is exposing people to um, these same toxins again a lot lower than cigarettes and it dissipates much quickly so not nearly to the degree of um, secondhand smoke but it is it absolutely we know that it does still get inhaled by users but again it's it's probably one of those harm reduction things, but we counsel all parents that they cannot vape in front of their parent or in front of their children. So great question. There is a bill that's been um, introduced in the legislature to, to raise the um, tobacco age to 21. So there is some significant support for that. And as this, you know, 18 states have raised the age of tobacco to 21. Um, and I think we're up to 500 cities and counties. Um, so there is, there is a movement. So I think that's gonna hopefully positively impact us you know the e-cigarette industry has been supporting raising the age of tobacco to 21 it's been this very sort of confusion confusing dynamic mitch mcconnell kentucky introduced legislation to raise the federal age to 21 and people were just scratching their heads figuring out what was going on here 
And it seems like the e-cigarette companies were really fighting against the flavor ban. Now, as the federal government's now called for a flavor ban, you know, there is, they're sort of teetering, they're struggling, the e-cigarette industry is struggling because they don't want flavors banned from a business standpoint, but they realize that this is really hurting their marketing. The youth, is, the youth craze is causing such a negative backlash against the e-cigarette industry. Jewel yesterday announced that they're pulling all flavors off the market, except for tobacco, mint, and menthol. So it's not a sufficient flavor ban, but Juul has been doing this. They pulled flavors out of retail stores last year and had them only online. So there's been this cat and mouse back and forth game between the federal government and Juul. But I really think Tobacco 21 has to happen nationally, and I think we need to ban all flavors, including mint. Teenagers are using mint. Mint is appealing. So we have to get rid of that flavor. And again, there's gonna be the consequence of adults aren't gonna like these devices as much, but the adult appeal of flavors is nothing like the appeal in adolescence. Absolutely. So, um, repeat the question. Sorry. So, if you have somebody that is using e cigarettes and wants to quit, where do you go? Especially the teenagers. Um, it's, a, it's a tough situation. The FDA nicotine replacement therapy is approved down to the age of 18. So, some pediatricians are uncomfortable prescribing this. This is sort of viewed as an adult medicine. But I would absolutely recommend that the teenager that wants to quit sees their doctor, and that pediatricians get comfortable prescribing nicotine replacement therapy. The Truth Initiative also has a great texting program for teenagers. Over 50,000 have set up as sort of this motivational text to quit program, because they know the e-cigarette amongst adolescent users, kids want to quit, but now they're hooked. So there aren't great treatment options out there, and the treatment options that are out there aren't approved for kids. So pediatricians are a little bit less comfortable prescribing those medicines. One more question. Okay, with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is it good?